thank you, um, David, for that introduction. Um, so throughout this conference um, and throughout my career, I have listened to consumers who are much more eloquently able than me to discuss um, the personalised yet very social and behavioural aspects of their enjoyment of vaping. And this convinces me that in quitting smoking, alternative nicotine products are far more than simply nicotine replacement. Um, so in this talk, I attempt to discuss new scientific understandings of nicotine by reflecting and theorising on the way in which society and culture currently think about nicotine use in everyday life. As a social scientist, I'm particularly concerned with the, the way in which social and cultural influences um, change patterns of consumption at an individual level. And because I work within a medical school, I'm also particularly concerned with considering the consequences of social and cultural inf influences on human behaviour and the implications that they have for our medical treatment and intervention. So the points I'm going to make today are fairly simple, but points that we often forget about. Um, so I've come to think a lot about this topic over the last three, three years through a study that I've been involved in, funded by Cancer Research UK. The etc. study is a mixed methods longitudinal study exploring trajectories of e-cigarette use and particularly focused on the role that vaping may play in supporting not just smoking cessation but long-term abstinence from smoking. I have no conflicts of interest to declare in undertaking this talk or in the wider etc. study and I also just want to take the opportunity to thank the fantastic research team that I have the pleasure of working with at the University of East Anglia and particularly thanks to Sarah Jakes who I hope is here this morning who has always taken the time to give the consumer view on our work which is incredibly valuable. So. We have a number of studies um, emerging from the etc. study, three papers currently published or in the process of being published, and a poster on display here at the conference I'd obviously ask you to go and have a look at. Um, all of them take the underpinning theme um, that the, um, about the importance of social and cultural factors that are critical but often forgotten in supporting long-term abstinence from smoking, where vaping is a real alternative for consumers and also acknowledging the importance of pleasure in engaging in a behaviour when switching from smoking, such that vapors, many vapors that we talk to in our research tell us that they come to prefer alternative forms of nicotine, particularly vaping, over tobacco smoking. So this is something really exciting for harm reduction, because vaping offers people not only a substitute option, but something that they actually prefer. So. In terms of thinking about the way that society and culture see nicotine, it's important to look to our history um, and think about the way that society has historically seen nicotine addiction and the impact that that has. So the central thesis of my talk today is that the way that we, and by that I mean society, academics, scientists, members of the public's, public, the way that we view nicotine use, and particularly nicotine addiction, is historically situated and driven by the dominant discourses that operate in society at any one time. So this matters a very great deal. As humans, we are social creatures. We want to belong. We want to feel a sense of belonging to our social group, and we want to identify with a group. This might be a minority subgroup, or it might be identifying with the wider population and feeling that you are part of a, 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 the, the wider good. As humans, we want to be accepted and feel that we are behaving in a way that is socially acceptable. We also seek to engage in activities that establish and maintain group bonds. So in previous work on the role of smoking relapse, I've argued that nicotine use through cigarette smoking may be seen as a symbolic form of social exchange that helps to maintain and solidify group membership. So the way in which society views that um, symbolic exchange matters very much. It impacts on individual consumption behaviours and has consequences for whether or not we see nicotine use as problematic and then in turn how we respond to it. So it's very difficult to demonstrate the effectiveness of public health campaigns in changing societal discourses. I'll just give one illustration here that I think is quite important. This data demonstrates at a population level the interaction between policy, cultural discourse and public opinion. So you can see that historically, back in um, 2004, there was very low level of support for smoke-free legislation in the UK. 
um, at a time when voluntary policies were introduced for smoke-free public places. But when that, that legislation came into force in 2007, um, public policy really changed such that the majority of the public now are very in favour of smoke-free legislation. So this shows the interactive impact of policy and cultural attitudes, such that I would argue that in the UK at least now, we are starting to see a re real denormalisation of tobacco smoking as a behaviour. My core argument is that we have moved over time from seeing nic nicotine addiction, which was prim primarily then understood to be through the form of tobacco smoking, as a form of recreation. So, Back in the 1940s and prior to that, nicotine was seen as recreational. Um, it was seen as a treat, something that um, a majority engaged in, something that was glamorous. Um, although it it, um, the concept of addiction was beginning to have negative social connotations. And I would argue that this was particularly so for some groups. So, for example, women who have to deal and grapple with the competing discourses around femininity, being a good mother, duty and caring roles, also were grappling with the morally laden view that came to be associated with being addicted to a substance, in this case, nicotine. So now, perhaps, at this current point in history, we may be again becoming to see nicotine use as, um, as recreational, since um, recently we can remove the nicotine use from the mode of delivery of combustion through tobacco smoking that we now know, of course, to be so harmful to health. This is perhaps a reflection of the cyclical and reactionary nature of societal views, which may very likely be politically driven or aimed or aligned to the dominant political discourses of the time. Each viewpoint in society, I would argue, is a direct reaction to that which has gone before. Interestingly, I would argue that societal views um, have almost been divorced from the mainstream medical opinion and evidence that circulates in society. So this suggests that societal discourse is more influential on behaviour than what we know from medical evidence. We see this at the moment um, to an extent in the UK. The survey um, published by Ash in February this year showed that despite growing evidence and medical consensus that e-cigarettes are much less harmful than tobacco smoking, still 25% of the adult population believe that vaping is actually more harmful to health than smoking. And this really mirrors history. So the first seminal study by Doll and colleagues making the clear link between tobacco smoking and lung cancer was published in 1950 but it was not really until around the 1980s that there was widespread public cult and cultural discourse accepting the harms of tobacco smoking as making significant um, impact on health. So, I recognise that my talk today is particularly Western-centric, particularly situated in my U UK context, and for that I apologise. Um, but the central thesis of my talk is that societal views are historically situated and driven by dominant cultural discourses, which in turn impact on individual behaviour. I take my definition of societal discourse at the widest possible level. So when I talk about discourse, I'm talking about the messages that media give out, and of course, at this moment in time, considering the huge impact of social media, and also including formal academic theories of media discourse and attempting to encapsulate the dominant societal view of the time. Discourses are not tangible, they're quite difficult to talk about, they're overarching concepts, but they are extremely influential on behaviour by a pro process that I guess you could sort of liken to a kind of social os osmosis. The consequences of being subsumed within a culture with its bombardment of images, discourses and morality are, I would hypothesise, perhaps the strongest influences on behaviour, whether or not individuals have a physical addiction and whether or not behaviour is under conscious control. So here I use Broffenbrenner's um, model, social ecological model as a demonstration of the, wide, of the multiple levels of social and cultural influence on behaviour to show how the wider media and cultural discourse may interact at, at the individual, social, organisation and community levels. So the heart of Broffenbrenner's theory remains the ecological perspective. So this is stressing the person in context and in relation to their social and cultural environment. So from the early 1900s through to the 1940s, occasional tobacco use was seen by society as recreational. 
even sometimes a marker of social class. Dependent use, however, was seen as different, perhaps demonstrating a weakness of character or a psychological flaw. The consequences of this dominant societal view at the time were that we could largely ignore or dismiss nicotine addiction through tobacco use as something unworthy, really, of, of, in, of investigation, or we could treat excessive use using psychological therapies. The Royal College of Physicians reports of 1962 and 1961 reported on the seminal work of Doll and colleagues and, ma and made the firm link between smoking and lung cancer and a really strong epidemiological case for the health harm of smoking. At the same time, there was recognition in society of the addictiveness of smoking. So there was recognition that there was perhaps more to dependence than simply a weakness of character. Could there be a physical cause? So the RCP report created a media storm at the time with an ambivalent and even hostile response from some parts of the media, also from government and society. So interestingly, The Lancet published some high-profile critiques of the methodology of the RCP report at the time, creating very confused and ambivalent social and cultural messages. And we see this happening again in recent years. So the Public Health England report of 2015 also was heavily criticised in The Lancet by academics um, where the methodology was criticised and even claims were made about some of the authors of the reports. So the consequence of this knowledge um, about that gradually came into cultural discourse about um, nicotine as being physically addictive was that nicotine dependent users were, some, were in some senses let off the hook of being psychologically flawed. If nicotine was, addiction was seen as physical, then perhaps it needed treatment. And so it came to be that nicotine was understood to be physically addictive and the medical model of nicotine addiction as a disease came to the fore of public discourse. As a consequence, our reaction to nicotine addiction was to treat the disease with medication. So NRT was first registered for use in the UK in 1982, and since then we've had also had other medical um, options for treatment of nicotine addiction. The gold standard of treatment in the UK is to combine medication with behavioural support to stop smoking, and we had the establishment of the specialist stop smoking services in the UK in 1999. But of course, we now know that addiction is far more than a medical disease. Here I present a psychosocial model of nicotine addiction that we refer to in our etc. study. And this model really foregrounds cultural and social um, factors alongside physical and so psychological influence on nicotine using behaviour. Taking this model as our underpinning concept, it is clear that medical treatment for nicotine addiction can only get us so far. Different approaches are clearly needed beyond medication, which does attend to the physical need of nicotine addiction, but we also need to attend or substitute the psychological, cultural and social needs that are so important to smokers. And this is especially important, I would argue, when we think about maintaining abstinence from tobacco smoking in the long term, which of course should be our long term goal. Now, of course, we have the electronic cigarette and other forms of alternative nicotine delivery devices. These offer a pretty much a rapid form of nicotine delivery, which almost mimics um, cigarette smoking, but also they are able to mimic the behavioural action, the social element of smoking that smokers have previously enjoyed so much, and possibly also meet an identity need that is highlighted as very important by ex-smokers. So vaping offers the continuum of a smoker identity for those who choose that route, or offer the, the a possibility of a whole new vapour identity for those that wish to engage in particular subcultures. So work published by McNeil and colleagues in 2015 established that in the UK, most current e-cigarette users state that they use e-cigarettes for smoking cessation or to cut down from smoking. And in our Exceptor study due to be published on the 20th of June, we demonstrate that e-cigarettes may also offer a unique harm reduction innovation for smoking relapse prevention because e-cigarettes seem to meet these social and identity needs that other forms of treatment for nicotine addiction have so far been unable to address. Many vapers actually report that they find vaping pleasurable and enjoyable. We heard an excellent talk from Sarah Jakes yesterday who made this point very clearly. 
So vaping is more than a substitute. It is actually preferred over time to tobacco smoking. It is a viable and attractive alternative. So, currently the picture in the UK is not as simple when we think about societal discourse that addiction to nicotine is bad for health. There's a much more nuanced understanding emerging. There is increased understanding that there are degrees of nicotine addiction and there are degrees of relative harm associated with the form that nicotine is delivered in. So, where are we now? Well, I would suggest that we are experiencing the dawn of a new era where the morally laden societal views of addiction to nicotine perpetuated by the medical model or by psychological models of um, deficits um, in human behaviour are shifting. Um, such that in the UK, at least, addiction to nicotine is coming to be understood in society in isolation from tobacco smoking. And the wider culture is just starting to come around to understanding the possibility of less harmful use of nicotine through alternative nicotine delivery products, and particularly e-cigarettes. The consequence of this is that vaping is becoming increasingly accepted and normalised in the UK as a recreational form of nicotine use. However, of course, we still have a long way to go. This newspaper report I came across just a couple of weeks ago. Carl, Carl Lund yesterday in his excellent talk um, addressed the misperceptions of relative risks of public, of public discourse and the consequences of thought pollution. So this idea of thought pollution is an illustration of how societal discourse may influence behaviour. Um, and it's these kind of messages that still are creating confusion in the wider culture, perpetuating a, a discourse of confusion and suggesting that there is a mismatch still continuing about the actual harm to health of using nicotine separately from tobacco smoking and myths about vaping as being dangerous in its own right. So I would suggest that such reporting is dangerous. It's highly influential at a societal and cultural level in terms of influencing individual level behaviours. And of course, we would wish for dominant societal discourse where possible to encourage in individual behaviours that are safer and less harmful to health. However, I don't want to end on a negative note. Um, despite these kind of um, media discourses that are still circulating, um, I would argue that we are experiencing a new era for social and cultural views of nicotine use removed from tobacco smoking. Um, I've argued that societal and cultural views of nicotine addiction have shifted over time in a somewhat cyclical nature, and we na may now be experiencing a shift back to seeing nicotine use as recreational, just as we once saw nicotine use through smoking as recreational. As a consequence, this suggests that our response to nicotine addiction can now be removed from the medical model, which suggests that the need for treatment. Clearly, tobacco use is extremely dangerous to health, and there should be support and intervention available to help people to switch to lower risk ways of using nicotine. For the good of public health, we need to work to promote pop positive public discourses of recreational nicotine use in order to promote engagement with reduced harm alternatives to tobacco smoking. Thank you.